The Story of Jonah. Once upon a time, there was a man named Jonah who quarreled with God. Get up, Jonah, the Lord said to him one day. Go east to Nineveh and tell the people there to mend their wicked ways. But Jonah did not want to do that. And so he boarded a ship going in the other direction towards Tarshish. They had not been sailing long before a great storm came up and the sailors on the ship said, pray to your gods, everyone, or we all will be drowned. Then they looked at Jonah, knowing that he was a fugitive, and they asked him, look here, what have you done? I'm I'm sorry, he replied, it's my fault. I'm running away from God, but of course, it is he who made the sea as well as the land. You had better throw me overboard. Don't blame us for this, Lord, said the sailors, and they threw Jonah into the water. But Jonah did not drown. Instead, God sent a great fish to swallow him up. Jonah slid down into the belly of the fish where it was cold and dark, and there he laid for three days and three nights. Here I am, Lord, he cried, down in the belly of the fish, still praying to you, still praising your holy name. And then the Lord heard this. He had mercy on Jonah and made the fish vomit him up again onto dry land. Now do what I said and go to Nineveh, said the Lord God. And this time Jonah went. He prophesied to the people there that they would be destroyed if they did not repent within 40 days. At this, everyone in Nineveh, including the king, put on sackcloth and ashes. They mourned sincerely for their sins and prayed to the Lord night and day. Meanwhile, Jonah went to the city and sat on the hillside waiting to see what would happen. Nothing happened, and this made Jonah furious. I knew you would forgive them, he shouted at God. That is why I did not want to come here in the first place. You're always forgiving people, and so I've gone to all this trouble for nothing. But God only answered him gently. Are you right to be angry with me, Jonah? And as Jonah sat there soaking in the hot sun, the Lord made a little plant to grow over his head and cheer him. Jonah greatly enjoyed the cooling shade. Then, the next day, God sent a worm to destroy the plant, so Jonah was left sitting in the blazing sun again, angrier than ever. I might as well be dead, he said to himself. Then the Lord said to him, Are you right to be so angry with me about the little plant, Jonah? I grew it for you, but I also made Nineveh, which is a very large city. Should I have no mercy on that fine, foolish place where there are 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left? Not to mention some very valuable cows. Hear now these words from James. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor. Speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment.
Good morning. morning. Draw your circle wider. Let us pray. So here we are, Lord, your men and women. We come from so many different places. We are such different people. But we are gathered here today in worship, and so we ask that as we worship together, you will bless us, that your word might be spoken, that you will bless us, that we will have ears to hear your word, and that you will bless as we go forth from this time of worship, that we will live transformed lives in your world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I was one of the first African Americans to be accepted to George Washington University in 1958 when they opened their scholarship program to all students in DC public schools. So there were only five of us African American students there. While completing my degree there, I encountered a fellow student, a young white male, in one of my classes. After class, lingering in the classroom, he began to ask me various questions, and I responded to him thinking he was trying to be friendly, trying to understand me and my world. Clearly, this was a new experience for him. I don't remember which class it was. I don't remember his questions. I don't remember his name now. But I do remember the day I encountered him for the first time outside of the classroom on the steps of the student union. We were the only two people there at that time, and he walked by me as if I was not there. I remember the pain, even after more than 50 years have gone by. I came to realize that he was not interested in me as a person, as a friend, as a fellow student. At best, he saw me as a curiosity piece, but he could not see me in the stairwell. Perhaps that is why a poem named Incident by Conte Cullen means a lot to me. It is etched in my memory, a corollary of my experience that day at George Washington University. Conte Cullen wrote, once riding in old Baltimore, Heart filled, head filled with glee. I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. But he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December, of all the things that happened. That's all that I remember. What about you? When has the issue of racial prejudice crept out of its hiding place and hit you smack in the face? What about it do you remember? I was reminded of my experience with that student in the stairwell in the days surrounding the police beating of Rodney King in California. On one newscast, after the acquittal of the police who were uh, in that beating, a reporter interviewed, among others, a young African-American man. The reporter described him as a son any mother would want, a good student, a Christian, whom the interviewer encountered as well-dressed and mannerly. But here is something the young man said. When I walk down the street and people act as if I am not there, it makes me feel I could do anything and it wouldn't matter because I don't exist. What a sad commentary on our social context. Have we seen over the last few months evidence that this feeling of invisibility has produced some of the situations we have seen unfold? Are we seeing the consequences of our communal sins, the history of discrimination, and narrow circles of inclusion? In the service today,
the United Methodist women are focusing on racial prejudice, on their charter for racial justice. Racism and white privilege are so entrenched and so much of what we deny is real that they pass as normal, not aberrations of healthy social relationships. Given the recent events we all know so well now, given the history of our nation with slavery, with the undoing of the efforts of reconstruction at the end of the Civil War, with Jim Crow laws and segregation, and racially motivated discrimination, I remember the white-only signs. Given the history of Christians and their institutions that failed and continue to fail to love those they see as other, as different, as less than, we need to focus on our role in perpetuating racially-based bias, our benefiting from its effects, and our ignoring of the harm it generates. When my daughter arrived in the United States from Grenada at the age of four, the story of Jonah became one of her favorites. She had me read it from a storybook over and over again. And when her mother came to Wesley the next year, the exhibit in the gallery included a depiction of Jonah's, the, of Jonah's story. And it was an abstract. I imagine that her fascination with the story of Jonah was stimulated by Jonah's experience and the big fish that swallowed up this dissatisfied servant of God. She recognized that abstract as a story of Jonah. She was unaware of the prejudice Jonah held against the Ninevites. She missed the fact that Jonah was a bigot. Did you miss it too? Jonah's circle of care, concern, and love was not wide enough to include the Ninevites. Jonah finally did what God commanded, responding to God's call on his life, but Jonah's heart wasn't in it. What about you? Let's look into the heart of Jonah. The Ninevites were noted for their ferocity and cruelty in battle. And Jonah seemed to feel that they would and they deserved to remain in spiritual darkness, alienated from God. To Jonah's astonishment and his dismay, when Jonah delivered God's message to Nineveh, it led the king of Nineveh to remove his robe, put on sackcloth, and cover himself with ashes as a symbol of repentance. And then the king commanded a citywide fast. God responded to their actions. But when God changed God's intention to destroy the city, Jonah was not happy. In fact, he was furious. He declared that he would rather die than see the enemy, the Ninevites, receive mercy rather than punishment from God. And despite their previous spiritual darkness, despite the Ninevites' repentance, Jonah was unwilling for them to be included in the elected people of God. Now, these Ninevites were not completely in the other category to the Hebrew people. They spoke a dialect that was connected to the Hebrew language. Jonah's experience and story are a moral lesson. What would you say that lesson is? It is not simply about obedience to God's call on our lives. The story and experience of Jonah expresses the truth that God's concern for humanity is not confined to the Jews, to those who think they are in, to those who think they are favored, to those who think they are better than other human beings who are different from them in whatever way diversity presents itself. God's concern is as wide as the world itself. God's concern circles all that God has created. How wide is your circle? The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible reminds us that the book of Jonah comes from a time when, Nineveh, when Nehemiah and Ezra were advocating for a policy of racial exclusiveness, narrow nationalism, and religious intolerance. They saw this advocacy as a way to preserve the unique heritage of the Jewish faith. 
but they were misguided. The Ninevites were regarded by the Jews as the epitome in the Gentile world of vicious practices, blasphemous language, and irreligiosity. Yet God cared about them. We are called to look at the world that God has created with the eyes of God. Jonah's character, Jonah's attitude, Jonah's expectations were incongruent with God's mercy and grace for all, with God's hasid, covenant love, for all God's creatures. God's divine will is to sustain the lives of all of God's creatures. God so loved the world. God wants the circle of abundant life to include all. In both Testaments of the Bible, we are called over and over again to widen our circle of love. Love of God, love of our families, love of the other, love of enemies, love of our spouses, love, love, love. What does it mean to love? Words of love are not enough. Love is an action. It is our intentional behavior that seeks to see good in the other and to act in ways that nurture that good to its fullest. Jesus crossed over the barriers of race, culture, theology, and gender. He widened the circle of the society and culture into which he was incarnated. It upset the religious authorities and challenged the beliefs of the people. But Jesus did it anyway. Our reading from the book of James reminds us that that is what Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, is calling us to do. We need a worldview that encircles all, overcoming our prejudice, our taught and inherited prejudices. We are all in this together. We are one with each other, or we are not a part of the body of Christ. Too many who call themselves Christian have little recognition of the truth that the fate of each one of us is bound up with the fate of each of one of the others of us. I hear this as an underlying unrecognized truth as I watch the presidential campaign unfold. Human solidarity, our, interde our interdependence, our common humanity, our common de destiny require wider circles, change knowledge and understandings, change attitudes and change behavior. Our real beliefs are revealed by what we do and what we say. In the world of exclusionary insults, none is more telling of our hidden prejudices than saying to someone, you are not like all the others. It is evidence to those who are aware and receive these words intended as compliments of the prejudice that underlies the claims of inclusion. I've heard it too many times in my life, and I have been deeply insulted every time. Are we courteous and kind, gentle people, but people who hold one prejudice or another, who have drawn a circle that leaves out some somebodies outside of our world of inclusion? Jonah remained a narrow little nationalist who despised others. The book of Jonah is read in worship on the Jewish Day of Atonement not only to draw persons closer to God, but closer to other human beings. It is a time in worship which calls the people to draw their circle wider. Wesley is a place that is probably the most diverse seminary in the country. That diversity comes in many forms. How have you reacted to it? We cannot hide from God here in seminary or in the belly of our whale. God knew about Jonah. God knew his heart. God knew where Jonah had drawn his line of exclusion, his circle of exclusion. Wherever we are, 
whatever we believe, whatever we do, whomever we want to exclude, whatever hidden biases we hold, God knows. And they emerge in one way or another. We are called to do no harm, do good, keep in right relationship with God through our right relationship with the other. God uses people as instruments of change. Do you hear God's call to you to be an agent of transformation? Are you willing to be an instrument in breaking down any barriers to abundant living for others? Are you living out that willingness in your day to day interactions. If we are to be God's instruments, we must first be clear about who we are. If you and I have distanced ourselves from any of God's children by circling them out, we need to pray to the Holy Spirit to reveal and heal our hidden faults so that we can close the gap, take down the barrier, and draw the circle wider. Each of us has internally determined boundaries that have shaped and are shaping our beliefs. They shape our attitudes, which shape our behaviors. They are like circles in which we are the center. Who have you circled out? Are you a Jonah in any way in your heart of hearts? How wide is your circle? How wide is my circle? However wide our circles are, we must draw them wider. So don't be a Jonah. Be transformed by always drawing your circle wider. If you would pray this prayer with me, then sing using these words, and I'm gonna read the words to you, and then they're there. And some of you will recognize it as a hymn, that, a song that I have changed. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need to change. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need to change. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need to change. Not the other or the stranger, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of change. Uh, will you pray with me? It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need to change. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need to change. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need to change. Not the other or the stranger, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of change. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need to change. 